All right, let's start off with Thompson's experiment. And if you recall, J.J. Thompson was the one that um, it basically discovered the charge to mass ratio of the electron, which we'll write as Q over M, or Q sub E over M sub E, if you will. And his setup was, was uh, quite simple. And so he used basically two things. He created an electron, uh, sorry, an electric field and a magnetic field. And he used those to deflect a ray of electrons and measure the, the, you know, the outcome. And so, first of all, what, the thing that he started with, he needed a beam of electrons moving at a, more or less a uniform velocity. And the way that he did that was use what's called a cathode ray tube, where you apply a voltage between, say, two plates, and the electrons start rushing from, you know, the negatively charged plate to the positively charged plate, or the negative voltage to the positive voltage. So I'm going to kind of uh, try to diagram that out. And now keep in mind, I am absolutely not an experimental physicist, so it's entirely possible everything I say will be patently false here, but this is how I would set it up if I was doing this, at least in a theoretical construct. Um, for the most part, whenever I walk into a lab room, just everything breaks. So, so trust me with a blackboard and not a circuit breaker. Um, all right, so basically what we can do is we can charge up two plates or attach them to a, a uh, power supply, and we're going to put, we're going to apply a positive voltage and a negative voltage here. And so basically this becomes positively charged, that becomes negatively charged. And so the individual electrons themselves are gonna to want to jump ship from the negative to the positive. And so they're all gonna rush at more or less a uniform velocity uh, under the same given voltage here. And what we can do is put a kind of a hole in that other plate. And so we have this stream of electrons here that are coming out at more or less a uniform velocity, uniform direction here, and we can now start to apply various electric and magnetic fields. So the first thing we want to do is we're going to now put in a separate region of space, let me, I'll use green here. So I'm going to put two plates kind of similarly how, to how we're doing this, um, but now I'm going to apply a potential difference from, we'll say this is our positively or positive voltage, that's our negative voltage. So again, here we, we hook them up to some power supply. It's more or less how you would draw that. And so you have a positive uh, uh, potential difference from negative, to po from negative to positive, and that's gonna cause the electrons to basically be attracted to the positive plate here. So the electrons, if this is all that occurs, the electrons are going to want to, well, and let, let's actually draw in the electric field. When you charge up the plates like this, it creates a uniform electric field. And this is, we're basically talking about a capacitor here. And you can think of it, two parallel charge plates. So we have some electric field that points downwards. Now, at the same time, what we're gonna do here is apply a magnetic field, and I need to make sure I, we do it in the right direction. Um, we're gonna apply a magnetic field, which I'll draw in blue, and that magnetic field is going to point into the board. Sorry, uh, let me make sure again. Yeah, so the magnetic field will point into the board. And the, um, in that case, that means we draw it like that. It's, it, it's not supposed to vary in magnitude, but what I'm drawing there is B into the board and the electric field pointing down. So what's gonna happen here? If we balance the E and the B fields, by the way, we have a way of varying the magnetic field. For example, we have some external magnet. If you bring it closer or further, you can change the strength of it. It's something like that. Um, it's, it's definitely not that. Uh, but in theory, you have you could vary the E, the B field, vary the E field. And what you can do is, um, in this case here, the, the presence of only the magnetic field would cause a deflection of the electrons. And remember, there are electrons, so we need to use the left hand to analyze this. You take V cross B, using the left-hand rule here, the electron's velocity cross B, the magnetic field, that gives you a, result, a resultant force pointing downwards. So we have an electric force acting on the electrons that pushes them up. We have a magnetic force that pushes them down. And if we balance those two things properly, what we can do is make it so the electrons pass right through this chamber completely undisturbed. And again, the, that's, it's the, the important point to do there is 
as long as they're all coming out with a given velocity, you, you can, in theory, be able to balance these two forces. So based on that, you learn something really important about this. And we'll say that they come out with the same velocity and the same direction as they had before. So we can learn something really important about this. So let's mathematically analyze that and let's see what quantity we get from this part of the experiment here. By the way, I have to point out our uh, <laughs> uh, parallel plates uh, set up here looks strangely like an elephant <laughs> shooting out a beam of electrons. <laughs> uh, anyway, and the more I look at this, it's almost like we're shooting a beam of electrons out of a toaster <laughs> into an elephant's butt. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, so anyway, let's, let's, actually, let's mathematically analyze this here. And what I want to do is I, I want to calculate, based on whatever velocity V they're coming out at, I want to calculate what the relative electric and magnetic forces must be to cancel out. So given an unknown speed V, what uh, does E and V, E and B have to be to balance out? And we can analyze that mathematically by saying that the overall electromagnetic force, called the Lorentz force. In the presence of both electric fields and magnetic fields, and specifically if there is any velocity of a moved, uh, of a charging particle, or a charged particle, <laughs> um, the overall force that we have here is equal to Q times E plus V cross B, where again, that's the electric component when you distribute the Q, and this is the magnetic component when you distribute the Q. So really what we want is Fe, which is Qe. We want the magnitude of that to equal Fb, or that component of it. And let's just assume that we've already arranged all of our uh, uh, angles, our, all of our directions, so everything is at right angles. Everything is in the proper direction that this will give us a result upwards, this will give us a result only downwards. So I'm only going to be concerned about the absolute magnitudes from here on out. And in this case here, we can just now substitute QE must equal QVB. All of those strictly just being mag uh, magnitudes. The Qs cancel. And that's good because it doesn't depend on the charge that we're moving. It only depends on the relative strengths of E and B, and of course on the velocity. The nice thing now is we have an equation that says E equals VB. And specifically, as long as you, you know how you set your elephant circuit up, you know exactly what the electric field strength should be in there, or at least you can measure it. And as long as you are the one that created that given magnetic field, you should be able to calculate theoretically and then measure, test it, and see what that given value of B was that balanced the, the, the path there. So both E and B are known experimental you know, values. So what you can do is rearrange that and find that the ratio of E over B is exactly what tells us the velocity of those particles. So we've actually just measured the velocity of the particles by setting this up and tuning the E and B fields properly. And I think that's kind of a really cool result. And then of course, it's assumed that we can add the directionality onto it. And of course, if you're not doing this in the proper direction, that becomes a whole heck of a lot more complicated because you end up taking a sine there or a cosine there. But anyway, um, so we now have the velocity of the particle. Now the next thing is how do we connect that to its charge? Because that's really what, we, what we're concerned about. What is the mass of that electron? What is the charge of it? So let's erase this here and let's describe a new layout that we're going to do after we have done this elephant circuit experiment. <laughs> That's my new favorite thing about Thomas's experiment.
Okay, so what we're going to do now is we've only we've only taken away the second part of that you know setup here that we're keeping that weird toaster that shoots out electrons and specifically it's important because we don't want to change anything about this because we already know something really important based on that last part of our experiment where we had the we varied the electric and the magnetic fields we now know what the velocity of these electrons are so that is now a known value and once we now know that we don't want to change that all we're going to do now is replace the second part of this with a new experiment. And specifically, let's see. Uh, specifically, what we want to do now is just simply remove the electric field. And we're going to have these electrons coming through a region of space. And then we're going to turn on only a magnetic field. And if we line the magnetic field up properly, specifically in this case here, let me calculate this again. If we make that magnetic field into the board, Go ahead and write this here. You have a magnetic field like this throughout space. This electron, which again, according to the Lorentz force, you have to use your left hand because it's a negative Q, comes over here and it now has a velocity crossed with a magnetic field exactly like it did before. And it's going to gradually deflect rightwards according to its, you know, if it's facing forwards on its, you know, as it moves. And so it's going to gradually migrate rightwards, and as long as the magnetic field strength remains the same throughout, and as long as it's not dissipating energy for whatever reason, which there's a really interesting tale about that that, that will look up Cherenkov radiation. Um, I don't want to go further with that. But what's going to happen now is that that electron will now begin to undergo what's called cyclotron motion. And I, I didn't, honestly, the, the circle should begin exactly right there, but just to be able to kind of fit it on the part of the screen where I've drawn the screen, whatever, where I've drawn the magnetic field, I, this is effectively what would happen. So we're going to get a circling um, electric, a uh, circling electron, and we know what the velocity is or the speed. So that was measured from our first part. We know what the strength of the magnetic field is. And what we're now going to measure here is what is the radius r that it cycles with. So recall, again, this is uniform circular motion based on hopefully what you remember from physics one, that we're now going, we're applying a constant force. It always points inwards. It all, it's always going to point at right angles to our velocity based on the right hand rule. And that vector, that, that force vector will always point inwards throughout that circle there. So we're going to go around in a clockwise fashion, spin around and around, and you can, by, by um, for example, imaging, having a, a screen set up where you can image what's happening for very short time scales, you can actually see the circles that these particles make on these, on these uh, imaged plates. And so that's, that's precisely how, how you do this in a cyclotron lab. You have a big, huge magnet that creates a magnetic field, and then you just have particles that cycle around. And based on their, their radii that they cycle around and how fast they're moving, you can calculate what particles you just saw. And so that's, this is kind of one of those very first ever uh, particle physics ex experiments using a cyclotron, if not maybe even the first ever. So what we're going to do now is we're going to use our laws of uniform circular motion in combination with what we know about magnetic forces to be able to figure out, okay, what is that? How can we turn that known velocity into a known charge or mass? And if, that's, if that sounds a little confusing, just kind of watch how the mathematics comes out. Because really, this is the quantity that we want at the end. And this is magically, not magically, but mathematically going to turn out. So let's go ahead and measure, or sorry, let's go ahead and set this up according to a uniform circular motion force problem. According to, to Newton's... Laws for, that stands for uniform circular motion, uh, which I'm assuming that you've at least heard of the term centripetal force and um, uh, centripetal acceleration. If not, uh, whatever, you should have seen it. So we're going to say that the, the, um, geez, the centripetal force or the force pulling any object inwards in UCM is always going to be equal to its mass times its velocity squared divided by its radius. 
And to be entirely clear, I'm going to label this throughout as M sub E, because it's the electron that we're dealing with here. That's a known thing. We know what V is. This we just measured. So we don't know what that is, but we also don't necessarily know what that is. However, we do know that the magnetic field, which creates the magnetic force, sorry, the, the magnetic force, I should say specifically, is Q, I will call it QE, times V, which is again known, times B, which is known. And all we have to do in the end is recognize that in the absence of any other force, this, this magnetic force is exactly the same, or it's exactly what provides the centripetal. So you can just set an equal sign there. And you have a nice boxy equation box <laughs> uh, where everything equals everything. And in this case here, you can just take that. I've never set up an equation like that, but it actually works. Um, you can just <laughs> equate the right-hand sides of everything. And so now all we have to do is say that um, I'm going to put here the second one, QE times VB equals the right-hand side, ME B squared over R. Basic mathematical rearrangement. I'm just going to rewrite Q over M on the left-hand side. So just uh, divide both sides by ME. I'm going to get rid of these. So we now have QE over ME equals one of the V's cancels out. So we now have V over, oops, let me write it like this, V over Burr. But recall from before, we had E equaling QV. Sorry, E equaled um, v, VB. I'm sorry about that. So we already knew what the velocity was. Um, so I'm just going to rearrange again V equaled E over B. So we can just now substitute that in for V. So this becomes an entirely experimentally measurable value on the right, which is E over B squared R. Again, each of these three things are known values. And as it turns out, that, that it wasn't just Thompson that arrived at this. It, others can set this exact same experiment up, and, and you can as well, if you create your own cyclotron and your own cathode ray. But the ratio of this that you will always measure will always be exactly the same. You can increase the strength of the, mag uh, of the electric field, but you have to in increase the strength of the magnetic field according to its square to balance out. And that's because that always equals the, the ratio of electrons charged to its mass. So I'll just write that out here. QE over ME will equal E over B squared R. And it's important to note that just this is an experimentally measured value or simply a number. And in this case, the number in SI units is on the order of about 10 to the 12. Um, you can do that calculation. You can plug in 1.6 times 10 to the minus 17, 19 over, was it, um, something times 10 to the minus 31 kilograms. So it's about 10 to the 12 is that ratio there. And so you don't need to actually do an experiment to measure it. You can just look in a textbook now and measure it. But that's because we've measured this for 100 years now, that they didn't have those textbooks with those values at that point. So anyway, that's how Thompson's experiment set, set us up to directly be able to measure one of these, Q, so that we can now know what the fundamental mass is. Which, I mean, just... Understanding how important that itself is in the history of science is huge. We've now weighed the smallest thing that you could really ever weigh um, individually. And I say that because there are lighter things in the, in the universe called neutrinos and also quarks. But turns out you can't actually ever stop one of those or, or, or isolate those to weigh them. So this has allowed us to effectively, and this was over 100 years ago, effectively weigh the lightest thing we've ever weighed in the universe.